Here's the definition of quadratic functions uh, that comes directly from the basic squaring function and transformations, which are fundamental things in this course, fundamental concepts. Okay, so quadratic functions are represented graphically by horizontal and vertical shifts and vertical stretches of compressions of basic squaring function, of the basic squaring function. Okay, uh, so I mean, just got the basic squaring function. You can stretch it, compress it, flip it. You can shift it horizontally and vertically to put the vertex any place you want. By compression and stretching, you can make it as wide or as narrow as you want to fit whatever it is you're trying to fit. <clears throat> so if P of X is a quadratic function, it follows that P of X is the form A F of X minus X H plus K, because F of X minus X, X is horizontally shifted, multiplying by A vertically stretches it, then adding K, vertically shifts it. And it's of this form where f of x is a basic squaring function. Now, this is the general form of a stretched and translated function <coughs> for any function. This is always vertical stretch or compression by factor A. And of course, the way I do it, A includes reflection. If A is negative, you reflect across the x-axis. Uh, then f of x minus h uh, just takes, or A f of x minus h, if you wish, takes A f of x and shifts it h units horizontally, then k shifts it uh, k units vertically, uh, any function. Now, if p of x is A times the quantity x minus h, well, in, in this case, sorry, p of x would be where f of x is x squared. Well, this gives you f of x minus h is x minus h quantity squared. So A f of x minus h is A x minus h quantity squared, and then you add k. So there is the general function. That's a general quadratic function. Every quadratic function can be expressed this way for the appropriate A, h, and k. h, k, this point h, k is where the vertex goes. That's the vertex. That's where the vertex of the x squared function goes. The zero, zero point goes to h, k. So your vertex moves to the point h, k, and you have this vertical stretch that changes the elongation or compression of the function. Okay, I say that this is the standard form. Well, this is the standard form, or also called the vertex form of a quadratic function. It comes directly from shifts and stretches on the basic squaring function. The vertex is, as I said, h, k, and that's very clear. The reason should be obvious since zero, zero on the x squared graph, if zero, zero is on the graph of f of x, then h, k is on the graph of f, a, f of x minus h plus k. Specifically in this play, case, zero, zero is the vertex of the x squared graph, so that h, k has to be the vertex of the a, f of x minus h plus k graph. There it is, there's your vertex form. Now there are other forms, there's a standard form that we'll see in a minute. And it's quite valuable and quite useful depending on the situation. But the vertex form tells you more about the graph, tells you specifically where the vertex is and what the vertical stretch or compression of the original function is. Okay, now. Make sure I've got the right board here. I'm gonna to, to pause this recording for a second. Okay, so we have this vertex form, A, X minus H quantity squared plus K for the polynomial. And we can expand this. Okay, A times quantity X minus H squared plus K is equal to this because X minus H squared is X squared minus two HX plus H squared. Now that should be straightforward, but you know, assuming people are a little rusty with algebra, x minus h quantity squared is x minus h times x minus h. And x minus h times anything is x times that thing minus h times that thing by the distributive law. So x minus h times x minus h is x times x minus h minus h times x minus h. Now the distributive law applies again to each of these expressions x times x minus h is x squared minus hx. h times x minus h, well, minus h, let's say, times x minus h, 
would be minus hx plus h squared, giving us this result, and there we have it. This can then be expanded, multiplying through by the a, uh, we get an a on the x squared, we get an a on the 2xh, we get an a on the h squared, and we have ax squared minus 2ahx plus ah squared plus k. Here's our expression. This is of this form, ax squared plus bx plus c, which is a, almost certainly a familiar form to you, uh, where a is the same as it is here. B is the coefficient of x, and that's 2ah, negative 2ah. And C is what's left over that has no x. Um, and that's going to be your AH squared plus K. You don't have to remember that. You can always do it. But this is to convince you that this form is equivalent to, where is it, this form, for the values uh, that you very easily get for A, B, and C. Again, A is the same for this form as it is for this form. B is what's in front of X, negative 2AH. C is the rest of it, AH squared plus K. Now, P of X then equals AX squared plus BX plus C is another form of a quadratic. And a quadratic can be put into this form by translations and shifts and stuff, and by transformations. And if it's in this form, then it's in this form, okay? This is called the general form of a quadratic equation. Now, it's important whatever form you have to find the zeros of the quadratic function. And in general, and, and we're gonna go on into polynomials, but one of the things you have to know about polynomials to understand their, their graphs and their behavior is where the zeros are. So the zeros of P of X in this form, you set, the vertex form equal to zero. And the operations you use to solve for x are very straightforward. You subtract that k from both sides to get this form. You divide both sides by a to get this form. And then, well, then let's just stop and see what we have to do. Okay, first of all, we have x minus h quantity squared equals negative k over a. Now this kind of looks when you first glance at it like, a square is equal to a negative number. It can't happen, okay? I mean, it can happen, but you're not gonna have a solution. It can't be. There's no square that's equal to a negative number. Of course, negative K over A is not necessarily negative because K could be negative and A could be positive. That would make negative K over A positive. Or K could be positive, A could be negative, making negative K over A positive. In any case, we know that there's no solution if k over a is positive, because if k over a is positive, negative k over a is negative, and a square can't be negative. Well, if k over a is negative, though, or if it's less than or equal to zero, uh, then it's not positive, obviously. And also, negative k over a is greater than or equal to zero. In that case, this has two solutions, but in one case, one, okay? X minus H squared is equal to a positive number if X minus H is equal to the square root of that number. Also, if X minus H is equal to the negative square root of that number, because whether you square the square root of a number or square the negative of the square root of a number comes out the same. Well, this tells us that the solution to this provided k over a is less or equal to zero, is x minus h equals negative square root of negative k over a, or x minus h equals positive square root of negative k over a. Okay, so um, this tells us if x minus h is negative square root of negative k over a, x is h minus that square root, and if x minus h is positive, well, we add h to both sides, just as we did here. We get x is h plus square root of negative k over a. Okay, so we have two different solutions. As long as 
negative k over a is less than zero, that makes negative k over a positive. So the square root is going to be positive. So that h minus the square root is going to be different than h plus the square root. Now, if negative k over a is zero, which happens if k is zero and a isn't, then what? Well, then you only have one solution. You have h minus zero or h plus zero. Now, whether they call that one solution or two solutions kind of gets into semantics. Um, I say it's one repeated solution. The solution's repeated. Here, you have the same solution you have here if k is equal to zero. So that's important, okay? This is uh, kind of an important idea. Whether you remember the thing about k over a, we usually don't use negative k over a, um, but because we usually just solve an equation of this nature by putting in the values of a, h, and k and just doing the solution. We don't try to remember a formula for it. Still, we've established in very simple terms, relatively simple terms, that you can have no solution if k happens to be, well, if k over a happens to be positive. If k over a is negative or zero or negative, then you have two solutions if it's negative, one solution if it's zero. Okay, so we have all these possibilities for quadratic functions. You can have no solution, you can have one solution, you can have two solutions, depending on these parameters, ultimately on A, B, and C, or on A, H, and K, doesn't matter which. Okay, now, I'm going to put this over here so I can refer back to some of this stuff. Hopefully, this is going to be uh, easily visible. If k equals zero, which is one way that you could get this one repeated solution. If k is zero, then, well, negative k over a is zero. And pretty much um, that's the only way negative k over a is going to be zero. Uh, technically, unless a happens to be zero, but we're not going to worry about that. If k is zero, well, k is your vertical shift. Okay, let's go back to what this tells us. There's your vertical shift, meaning you have no vertical shift. You can have a vertical stretch. You can have a reflection across the x-axis if it happens to be negative, but you've got no vertical shift. You either have a horizontal shift or you can have a horizontal shift. Okay, so in general, if you have one repeated solution, that means you have no vertical shift. Major graph is going to just touch the x-axis. Because, of course, if you horizontally shift something with a vertex of parabola with a vertex of zero, you're going to get a parabola with a vertex on the x-axis. I said vertex of zero. If the vertex is at zero, zero, then it's on the x-axis. Any horizontal shift, any h, is going to keep you on the horizontal axis. And you're going to have a graph that looks maybe like this, maybe like this. Now, this could be to the left of the y-axis. This could be to the right of the y-axis. Or either one of them could be right on the y-axis. Um, but you're going to get graphs that look like this. That's going to occur when your vertical shift is zero. Okay. Now, remember, k is your vertical shift. If k is greater than zero and a is greater than zero, then negative k over a is negative. And that's precisely the condition that gives you two solutions. And in that case, I said the wrong thing, okay? So I didn't do what I thought I did, I'm sorry. Okay, so K is greater than zero and A is greater than zero, negative K over A is negative. If negative K over A is negative, then you have a square equal to a negative and you get no solution. 
If you get no solution, that means the polynomial can't be zero. So it means that the graph either looks like, I'm sorry, this or this. Now, it's always above the x-axis if k is greater than zero, because k is your vertical shift. Okay, and there are no zeros if a is also greater than zero. So if it's above the axis, it doesn't have any zeros. Well, it can't be, the vertex can't be below the axis because a being greater than zero, the thing opens upward. And if it was down here, it would have zeros. It would open vertexes here. Your parabola is going to go through the x axis. It's going to have zeros. So you're going to have this or this. If k is negative and a is negative, it's the same thing. But of course, if A is negative and K is negative, that means your vertical shift is downward. And A less than zero means a parabola opens downward. So you have parabolas below the x-axis opening downward. They, again, don't go through the x-axis, so there are no zeros. The parabola or the uh, quadratic function will not be equal to zero. Okay, well, if you go to the general form, it'll want to look at the zeros. Well, you have the quadratic formula, okay? Now this could easily be proved from what we already have, or could be easily proved by completing the square, uh, but I'm just gonna assert it here because limitations on time. AX squared plus BX plus C equals zero, if and only if X equals negative B, either negative B plus the square root of B squared minus four AC, all divided by two A or negative b minus square root of b squared minus 4ac. Again, all divided by 2a. That's the only way the quadratic can be zero. And if x is equal to one of these values, the quadratic must be zero. So it's an if and only if statement. This is zero if and only if x is one of these values. Now, you know from what we just illustrated here that the quadratics don't necessarily have zeros. If they don't, well, what's under the square root doesn't have to be positive or zero. What's under the square root could easily be negative. A, B, and C can be anything. And 4AC could be bigger than B squared, often is, and you don't get any solutions. So uh, there's where your zeros are going to be. And it's a very handy formula. And often, uh, probably the majority of time, uh, when you get a quadratic, it's gonna be in the form of ax squared plus bx plus c function. I'm gonna use a quadratic formula. I'll note also that um, negative b over 2a, this quantity I've circled here, is halfway between the zeros. Okay, it's halfway between y. Well, because the numerator is negative b plus a square root or negative b minus the same square root. So wherever negative b is on the x-axis, you're gonna have negative b plus that square root or you're gonna have negative b minus that square root. Negative b is halfway between negative b plus something and negative b minus the same thing. Now that's something that should be easy to understand. Uh, and if it's not, you might not totally understand what I'm saying here, but um, it follows that negative B being halfway between negative B plus and negative B minus the square root, then negative B over 2A is gonna be halfway between negative B plus the square root divided by 2A and negative B minus the square root divided by 2A. That can be written out, it can be proven. It's kind of intuitively obvious if you, have certain type of intuition, which many people do. Uh, so negative b over 2a is halfway between zeros. Why do I make a point of this? Well, it's because the quadratic function, well, your basic quadratic function is clearly symmetric about an axis, well, about the y-axis in this case. And that y-axis is called the axis of symmetry. So you have symmetry about the y-axis for the basic squaring function. When you stretch the function, that symmetry is gonna remain. If you horizontally shift the function, well, 
then you think of the y-axis is getting horizontally shift. Well, that's it's not actually the y-axis of the horizontally shift, but it's the axis of symmetry. Okay. So if the y-axis was shifted over to x equals h, it would be the axis of symmetry, the new function. So we say that uh, this function inherits its symmetry about the vertical line through the vertex from the basic quadratic function. Now there's something else, but I've got to find it. I think it's on the back of this board, but I'm not sure. Yeah, it is. So oh, oh. I think it's almost half a pause the recording. Okay. This means that your vertex is going to be, well, again, again, the vertex of your basic function is the line y equals zero. Okay, the line through the vertex, vertical line through the vertex. So if you horizontally shift the function, the vertex is going to end up at hk. Okay. Uh, so I've got a statement here. The axis of symmetry is the vertical line through the vertex. And that axis of symmetry, the symmetry about that axis is inherited from the basic squaring function through the horizontal shift, which is basically what I've been saying. So we can say that um, this line here, it was probably clear in class, I hope it was, but it's not real clear now, that uh, this line is the line x equals h. So it's a line x equals h, vertical line with x coordinate h. Also, that has to be the line x equals negative b over 2a, because if this thing has zeros, uh, negative b over 2a is halfway between the zeros. And by the symmetry, if your x-axis was here, OK, again, the axis of symmetry has to be halfway between your zeros. Turns out that's true even if you don't have zeros, but we won't worry about that. Point is then that h is negative b over 2a. That's your horizontal shift. So if you have a quadratic function in the form ax squared plus bx plus c, calculate negative b over 2a. That's the horizontal shift you need along with the other transformations to get from the x squared function to the ax squared plus bx plus c function. So your vertex is at hk. And that's, of course, negative b over 2a, k if you want. But what we want to say here is now that vertex, what's k? OK, we figured out what the x component of the vertex is. What's the y component of the vertex? Well, the vertex lies in the graph of the function and on the axis uh, of symmetry, which is x equals h. To find the y coordinate when x equals h, you plug in h, whatever it is, into your form, into your function. Okay. Your function is p of x, so p of h is p of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c. Evaluate it at h. But of course, h is negative b over 2a. OK, that's a somewhat complex argument. It comes down to this. If you got ax squared plus bx plus c, you find the vertex. I'm sorry, you find the axis of symmetry, negative b over 2a, and plug whatever this gives you into the function. And again, this quantity is also the horizontal shift you need to build the function from your basic function. OK, now let's just do an example. You have y equals p of x is 3x squared minus 12x plus 4. Just a quadratic function I made up. OK, it has the form ax squared plus bx plus c. a is 3, b is negative 12, c is 4. Now, at some point, I did have the quadratic formula visible. Okay, here's your quadratic formula. So we can plug the value of A, the value of B, value of A goes here and here, value of B goes here and here. 
and the value of C goes here. We plug A equals three, B equals negative 12, C equals four into this form, and we get this. Here's B, here's B, right where it should occur. Here's A and here's A, corresponding to here and here. And right here's your value of C, which is here what should be. So there it is. We simplify this expression. First of all, you know, we square the negative 12, we get 144. And then four times three times four is 48. Have minus 48. 144 minus 48 is going to give us 96. We also have a negative negative 12, which we write as just plain old 12. And two times three, most of us understand, is six. Okay. So we get this expression. Now, this is not something that's going to give us a fraction or a, an integer or anything real nice, but it's fairly easy to estimate. At least I hope I estimated it correctly. Uh, okay. So the problem is the square root of 96. Okay. Uh, Square root of 96, pretty close to the square root of 100, which would be 10. A lot closer, at 96 is a lot closer to 10 squared, which is 100, than it is to 9 squared, which is 81. And looking at the difference and so forth, and uh, of course, I use other tricks, um, square root of 1 minus epsilon and stuff, but, um, and you don't know what that means. Uh, square root of 96, I'm quite sure. Yeah, as sure as I can be, uh, that that's going to be 9.8 to two significant figures. Okay, it's going to be pretty close to 9.8 actually. Um, so square root of 96 is about 9.8. 12 over 6 is 2. Square root of 96 over 6 is then about 9.8 divided by 6. And 9.8 divided by 6. 9.6 divided by 6 is 1.6, because 16 times 6 is 96. Um, and 0.8 divided by 6 is like 0 0.2 thirds, which is 0.033. Uh, and you don't need to worry about that. Check it on your calculator. I'm pretty sure that's going to be a pretty good estimate, three significant figures of the value of x corresponding to negative two plus 9.8 over six. I'm not absolutely sure about that three. Um, and I could, I, I could go further with the estimates, but there's no point. You can check it. If it's off, it's not off by more than a hundredth. Um, and if it is, please let me know. Uh, and then x equals two minus 9.8 over six, which would be your other approximation. Remember, these are approximate. So I got that wavy little part of the equal sign. Uh, that should be 0 0.037. Okay. Now, at some point, I sketched a graph. There it is. Um, so I need to get this down and put this up. And really, that's not it. Okay. I'm wrong. Looked reasonable, but that wasn't the graph. I think the graph is on the back here. Yeah, well, here's the graph. I did some more stuff first. But we found at least a good approximation to the zeros. And this graph that I've constructed here has a zero at about 0 0.037 and about 3.63. Of course, you know, that third significant figure isn't well represented in the graph. I'm not even sure about the second one. Um, okay, now you see that I've constructed this graph with these two zeros, two zeros that we got from the quadratic formula. But how do I know where the vertex is? Yeah. Vertex of this thing is on the axis of symmetry. Axis of symmetry is at x equals negative b over 2a. Okay. Um, and that, of course, I'll remind you, is h, 
that's your horizontal shift, which moves the axis of symmetry from the y axis to x equals h. Okay, the y coordinate of the vertex, how do we get that? Well, here's the axis of symmetry. It's at x equals two. We established that previously. Um, but not on this board, so I'm not going to refer to it. Okay, you look back, you see the axis symmetry is negative b over 2a, and actually uh, it's worth seeing this, that that negative b over 2a is your 12 over 6, which is this, which is your 2. So x equals negative b over 2a is 2. And it comes from negative negative 12 over 2 times 3, which is right here. Negative negative 12 over 2 times 3 is 12 over 6, which is 2. Now we want to find the y coordinate of the vertex. We don't know where the vertex is. We haven't found it. We don't have the standard form, which pretty much tells you where the vertex is. What we have is the axis of symmetry, and the formula for the function, p of x. Well, we plug in x equals 2. We get p of 2 equals negative 3 times 2 squared minus 12 times 2 plus 4. That's what we have right here. And that comes out negative 8. Now we know where the vertex is. OK, plug in the x coordinate of the axis of symmetry. And that's the x coordinate of the vertex. So we plug that in for x, and we find the y coordinate of the vertex. So the vertex is a two negative eight, that's your HK uh, for the vertex form. So if we wanna write the vertex form now, we know H and K, and of course we know A, so we can easily write out the vertex form. Um, and I might do that in a minute. Sticking with the process here. Uh, oh, actually, actually I did write it out. Okay, so you know HK and you know a, which is always the coefficient of x squared or the coefficient of quantity x minus h squared. So here's your vertex form. That's a times quantity x minus 2 squared plus a negative 8, okay, because h is 2 and k is negative 8. So here it is. Now we have a in front, but a is just the same as it is for p of x. So A is three, right here is the vertex form. If we had the vertex form, we'd already know that the vertex is at two, negative eight, and the vertical stretch is high factor three. Okay, well, take all that information and we put it together. Uh, and we see that the vertex is at neg two, negative eight. The zeros are here and here, and all that's nice and consistent, so we sketch an honest parabola through there. And then we notice uh, that we have a y-intercept here. Well, it's really, really easy to find a y-intercept if you have this form. Not all that hard in vertex form, but in this form, it's really easy because the y-intercept <coughs> occurs where x equals zero. So y-intercept is at p of zero. p of zero, we put in zero, this term and this term both give us zero because we're multiplying by zero and leave with just four. For any polynomial, then it's really easy to find the y-intercept. So you want to store that away because you're going to have to do that. Um, so there we have it actually written out. It's four. Uh, the y-intercept is at p of zero equals four. That's here. And that makes perfect sense in terms of the coordinates of our vertex and the two zeros that we plotted based on what we calculated. So that kind of brings us full circle. Now there's one example that we want to do. And you might wonder why we make a big deal of quadratic functions. You know, we'll say that quadratic functions are going to be a big deal on midterm exam and on final exam. Very important. One example of why they're important. Okay. Suppose you're manufacturing widgets and you want to sell them. Now, what's a widget? It's a common term in economics from 
anything you want to sell, anything you want to produce. Okay, whatever it is, this is what you're selling. Um, so if you charge X dollars for a widget, you figure that at least in the neighborhood of the prices you're likely to charge and your production capacity and all kinds of other decisions you might make. And don't, I'm talking like I know something and I don't know economics and I don't know business. Uh, I know the mathematics behind a lot of it, but uh, uh, don't, don't mistake me for somebody who's an expert in economics or business decisions. Okay. Uh, by one process or another, you determine that uh, in the range of the numbers of widgets that you're likely to be able to produce, if you charge X dollars for a widget, you expect to sell 12,000 minus 10X widgets. This means that for every extra dollar you charge, you're gonna sell 10 fewer, okay? So you'd think, well, why don't we just maximize this so sell as many widgets as we can. How do we do that? Well, just charge zero dollars for them and you don't have this negative thing here. And now you're gonna sell 12,000 widgets. Of course, you're not gonna make any money because you sell them for zero dollars, okay? So you don't wanna sell them for zero dollars. You'll sell a maximum number. Uh, apparently there are only 12,000 people out there who want widgets, uh, but not a good strategy, very bad business strategy to sell your product for free. Okay, you actually end up losing money because it costs you to produce them. You don't even make back your investment. Okay, uh, so the other thing is the more you charge, the fewer people are gonna wanna buy them. So you have this simple model that says, the number you sell is gonna be we'll just use Y, is to 12,000 minus 10X if you charge X, which means if you charge $1,200 for a, a widget, you're not gonna sell any of them. Who wants to pay $1,200 for a widget anyway? Okay, well, in this case, our revenue is gonna be what? You let R stand for revenue. Revenue is how much money you get. Well, to get how much money, to find out how much money you get, you multiply how many you sell, by how much you're selling them for. So it's a number sold times a price you sell per widget, the price per widget. And that's the 12,000 minus X, that's how many you sell, and you multiply that by X, and look at what you get. You get negative 10 X squared plus 12,000 X. So that's your revenue. Oh, fooey. I don't wanna make my minus sign look like a plus sign, it's a bad aim. Okay, so here we have this. Now, you might want to maximize your revenue. That might get you a promotion or something. But really what you want to maximize is your profit. So simplified model, let's say it costs you $100 to manufacture each widget. Now, really, if you're manufacturing X widgets, uh, you're going to have to put some money into uh, the production before you can even start manufacturing them. Like you've got to build your plant or you've got to retool your production line. Uh, so there's fixed costs also, and I'm ignoring that, but they don't complicate things much. Uh, so if it costs $100 to manufacture a widget, then your profit is going to be a little bit less. Okay. It's going to be your revenue minus big C, which is your cost. And your cost is $100 times your number of widgets. Each widget costs you $100 to manufacture, so it's gonna be, you know, you're gonna to have to subtract 100X off of this, and now you get your profit function. Still not a realistic profit function, because you'd also wanna subtract what it costs to retool your production line, for example. Uh, and that's gonna add another term here. If it costs you $10,000 to retool your production line, then you're gonna have, have a minus 10,000 here. And you're gonna have a quadratic. In this case, it's minus 10X squared plus 11,900X. If it's costing you 10,000 to retool, then it might be this and then minus 10,000, okay? Either way, you have a quadratic function. Now this particular quadratic function 
is zero when x equals zero. I mean, here's your function, right? We can factor this quadratic function and see that when x is zero, you're going to get zero. Of course, you can just look at it. Those terms have an x in them, so if x is zero, you're going to get zero. Also, if you factor the thing, you're going to get Never mind. I'm not going to factor it because this is different than this. Okay, uh, you can you can factor this. Okay, and you can easily determine from that or from the quadratic formula if you want to hit the net with a sledgehammer that this is going to be zero when x is eleven hundred and ninety. Okay, one thousand one hundred and ninety. Um, so we get the zeros. The vertex is going to occur halfway between the zeros at x equals 590. Well, that's your negative b over 2a. Um, and a is negative 10 and, and so forth. Uh, you find out that negative b over 2a gives you an axis of symmetry at x equals 590. Okay, there's your axis of symmetry. So now we can sketch the graph of our parabola. And we don't have a scale on the vertical axis, but you can take this x equals 590, which is the x coordinate of your vertex, and you can plug in here. It's going to tell you what the y coordinate of your vertex is. Now, why would you want to find the vertex? Well, here's your vertex. Haven't figured out the numbers, but here's your vertex. Vertex is on a graph of well, your, your, your revenue function is on a graph of profit versus price. What, do you, what can you say about what, it, what does this point represent? It represents the number, I'm sorry, the price you charge to get the maximum profit. This is where your maximum profit occurs, and it occurs if you charge $590 per widget. Charge $590 per widget, then you're going to lose uh, 5,900 sales, but you're selling them for $590, and that's a lot of money uh, to pay for a widget, but you know, apparently a certain number of people are willing to do that, and that maximizes your profit. So this illustrates that by graphing your quadratic function and understanding where the vertex lies and finding this vertex allows you to determine the price to charge to make as much money as you can. Significant. Now there are many other examples that you're gonna see of why you would want to maximize your quadratic function. Uh, but this is a rather good example, I kind of like it. Okay, well, that's it.